Lagan. Welcome, everyone. What a beautiful song. Thank you for joining us in our national anthem. I am Tony Lagans. I'm the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at SAGE. And I just want to officially welcome you all to our fireside chat today. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. One of the things that I wanted to um, explain is that a little bit about our ERGs. As Delma talked about, this is hosted by our POCs plus allies and our culture collective team. And our ERGs are really our employee resource groups. They put on different events just like this to help us understand each other, be educated about our different communities inside of SAGE, and create these celebration moments for us all to enjoy and immerse in each other's cultures. So I'm very happy to be able to present this wonderful fireside chat for you all today. We have um, our POCs have really set the bar for bringing in content that not only is engaging, but it helps us think and it thinks, helps us think about the future and where we want to go personally and where we want to take our company as a publishing company and where we want to see the impact of our diversity in the future products that we put out. So this is helping to continue that conversation. So I thank you all again for joining. Before we start, I'm going to hand it over to Monica Simon, who is our US lead for our Culture Collective team. Thank you, Tony. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Monica Simon. I'm the Organizational Development Specialist here at SAGE and based here in the DC office. Um, as Tony said, I lead the US Culture Collective. We're a group of employees who want to ensure that our SAGE colleagues feel a sense of belonging. And we do that by curating events. We host speakers. We recently formed a book club um, and other methods, again, to form inclusion and increase the sense of inclusion at SAGE. So welcome again. We're thrilled that Dr. Zasanti um, and Malef, um, I'm sorry, Sakai are here with us today. So I hope you enjoy our presentation today. Okay. Angelia Bedford Walker is the leader for the POC at Allies ERG. I'm Angelia Bedford Walker. Um, I'm one of the co-leads. My other co-lead was the wonderful leader in the song, Thelma Landry. We both um, co-lead the uh, people of color plus cultural change plus allies. Um, and Sage, we, I am um, out of the Thousand Oaks office, so I'm on the West Coast, and I'd like to welcome you today. This is our probably second biggest event that we've had. We have many more coming. We're people of color, so that's everyone that is Hispanic and Asian, and we are hoping um, our group will do more cultural events where you have an experience. That's what we're really about is an experience here at Sage. So with that said, um, again, welcome. I want to introduce Gianni <laughs> DeLima, and she will introduce um, our, one of our speakers. So thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny DeLima, or my given name, Gianni DeLima. I am glad to be here. Um, when I was asked yesterday to do the introduction for IO, I felt like I don't know if Io needs an introduction. For those of you who have met her, she makes you feel warm and at home and uh, helps you celebrate who you are and who she is immediately. Um, so I have been working with Io for nearly two years. We, as you probably, many of you have seen, are inseparable. But I thought that my role today here is to introduce you to the woman that she is and the woman that I work with every day, a woman who I admire and a woman that I hope that we continue to support in everything we do. So I am not Blaise SimQ. I do need notes. Uh, so <laughs> let me continue with that. So the social sciences aims to help us to develop the ability to make informed and reasoned decisions for the public good in a culturally diverse and interdependent world. Through history, scientific works, creators, producers, and consumers shape the systems populated by the methods and theories that are based on social con construct of race and culturally void observations and Western fabricated views of human intellect and behavior. 
IO has worked to ensure that the next generation of scholars and public servants reflect the diversity of viewpoints and lived experiences represented in this multicultural world. As a doctor, a PhD in political science, IO has, her research interest has been in black politics and international relations, specifically using linguism to understand how theoretical concepts are systematically embedded to promote structural racism that later become regulated through the legal system. The implementation of racist pedagogy that perpetuates policing of the black body, inequity, inequality, and marginalization based on race across the global south. IO is also a public servant for multiple federal agencies, something that a lot of people don't know. IO has been uh, involved in providing grant oversight in post-secondary schools and educational stories of marginalized groups. Her most recent work with the government has been managing the large portfolios of academic institutions under McNair, Javits, and Student Support Services. Her most recent role was developing and spearheading the program to identify and record the history of black veterans and other marginalized groups who are unnamed and unclaimed. Through her work, the uh, efforts to award grants to institutions, HBCUs, FSOs, and 5013s, and uh, to document the lives and struggles of marginalized veterans who fought in defense of our country, but fo were found unworthy to be buried in our nation's 155 national, state, and tribal cemeteries. In 2004, IELTS founded U Universal Right Publications, determined to reimagine the American dream as a Caribbean immigrant. UWP propelled her love for education and scholarship that would raise the bar and pivot the cultural paradigm by providing access to black scholars. The shift was not just to reclaim the narrative from black people being the subject of research, but to also being the authoritative voice and an instrument of people, cultures, and the social construction of race. This shift enhances the diverse voices of research, enables equitable representation, and fortifies the foundation of democratic balance. As we know at SAGE, that is also what Sarah had intended for us to do. Being a publishing activist, Io is also strongly believes that it is the imperative to racial justice, advocacy, and anti-racist publishing that the information that she provides at workshops, lectures, and engagement with academic institutions are integral to the institutions that are interested in strengthening and preparing students of color to publish early while centering their narratives within the various theories and methods that impact black scholarship, the legacy of black scholars, and the future of society. And with that, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce you to Dr. Alice I am going to have the extreme privilege and honor of introducing my mentor, Dr. Malefe Ketia Sante. Now, um, Gianni read a bio about me, but if anyone has ever heard of, read, researched, Googled, or done anything with Dr. Malefe Ketia Sante, you already know so much about him. He is phenomenal in every way that counts. When I met him, I did not know what Afrocentricity was. And he is the father of Afrocentricity. And learning Afrocentric principles, which I'm sure you will speak about as he, keep go as he goes through this talk, you know, that's what grounded me and centered me into who I am. There are other mentees of him here, and I see a lot of amazing scholars here as well who have studied and understood the work of Dr. Maleficent Asante. So I'm not going to read a bio because I think you can Google that and find that anywhere. But what I'm going to tell you is about the incredible man that he is and the kind of man that makes scholars like myself stand here today. My dissertation advisor, Dr. Daryl Taiwo Ari, is also here, and he's also a mentee of Dr. Maleficent Asante. <laughs> 
And when I took his classes in political science um, you know, at Howard University, it was Dr. Maleficati Asante who told me to go and find him, that he will guide me in the right direction. But when in, in order for that to happen, I first had to meet Dr. Maleficati Asante. And it was a class that I was taking that required me to pull research and do, uh, do um, a paper on black scholars and black philosophers. Dr. Asante's name was pulled and I was able to do the research. But like the reason why I'm not reading a bio to you is because I could find so much on the internet and I needed something unique. I needed something special. The man that he is, invited me to come and speak to him when I called him at his office and said, hey, I'm just a graduate student. I, there's so much about you on the internet. Please can I interview you? And as a scholar, a mentor, a teacher, a parent, he said yes. And it was from that cause that led me to this path, on this path, not only return, turning UWP around into a social science publisher, but also introducing me to Sage and all of you wonderful people that I get the privilege of meeting today. <laughs> yes, not yet, not, not yet. <laughs> he, 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 want, he wants me to stop talking about him because he's very humble. <laughs> he's very humble and he's very, very down to earth and human. I mean, when you meet this man, he puts you first. When you meet him, he does not meet you as Dr. Maleficati Asante, the most published African American scholar in the world, having recently published his 100 books. He does not greet you as the man that has traveled the world, is king, is king adorned in many African countries, have taught across the globe and traveled everywhere. He does not greet you as a man who is so powerful and so important to everything that we do here. He greets you as a humanist, as a, as a man from human to human, speaking to you from your heart. And this is why he's able to make the kind of change, the kind of impact, the kind of transition that he does every single day. So I would not be here without him, and I think, and I would like to think that you all are here also to see him and learn from him. So it was, it was with incredible pleasure and honor that I introduce you to the father of Afrocentricity, my mentor, my friend, <laughs> Dr. Maleficati Asante. Uh, let me uh, first of all start by uh, saying that um, uh, this is a remarkable occasion for many reasons. And th the first is, uh, this is the first time I've been, I want to say this to Todd Baldwin and everybody of this uh, Washington office, it's the first time I think I've been in the SAGE office uh, in DC and it is lovely and it's a beautiful space and the people are great. It's been really beautiful just being with you uh, these few hours. Uh, I want to thank uh, the, uh, the, the cultural uh, collective, uh, the Alliance and the Allies, uh, the people of color uh, of SAGE publication. Uh, I want to uh, recognize uh, certainly uh, Thelma and Angelia and uh, uh, certainly uh, Tony and um, um, Mi uh, Monica and all the people who've just made this wonderful event. Uh, uh, Jeannie, or Gian, uh, as I say, called her, uh, is an exceptional person and has been really delightful in making certain that uh, things work well here today and of course um, Dr. Ayo is uh, a superior person we really are delighted uh, I'm delighted to be on the program with her um, I want to start with I think there is a theme uh, to this day that uh, has been given and I want to start with it, and I want to start with uh, Sarah Miller McCune and uh, George McCune uh, when they were in Beverly Hills. Uh, I was uh, actually a new uh, professor at UCLA and went over with a friend of mine, Robert Singleton, uh, to meet them at the office of Sage Publications. There is a black revolution coming. We would like for SAGE to publish the Journal of Black Studies, to pay for it, 
to distribute it, to publish it, but have no part in the editorial production of it. The all editing is we will do. And we talked and talked, and finally we, we convinced them, and Sarah said, okay, we'll, we'll give this a try. And um, before you knew it, uh, it was done uh, in January 1970, we had the first issue of the Journal of Black Studies. And it was because this young woman and her husband at that time saw the passion that uh, Bob Singleton and I had in this idea. And she was tw 24. 24 years old, she, it was an incredible thing. And her, and her ambition, I believe, from what I could gather at that time, was to try to get an angle on influencing the whole field of social sciences. That's what, I, I mean, a 24-year-old young person coming from New York to California and claiming, I'm gonna control social sciences. That is, that takes a <laughs> lot of chutzpah. I mean, you gotta be really clear in your mind what you wanna do to do that, you know what I'm saying? So she came with that, that idea. So uh, for 53 years, I was the editor of the Journal of Black Studies until last year of SAGE. And it was a, a remarkable journey and it has been very beneficial to me and to the field of black studies. In fact, it, uh, SAGE has defined the discipline more than any other publishing company. And that is a remarkable achievement. And I just wanna, I wanna give great praise to uh, Blaze Simcue, who in my judgment is a visionary leader uh, a wonderful friend, a good brother, and, uh, and, and we've, we've worked together for a long time, for at least 25 or 30 years. So, so to see SAGE now, uh, as some of you probably uh, do not know, uh, an organization that when I started with them had like six or seven journals. And now to see SAGE now, I'm like, wow, is this the same company? But it's a, it's a drive and the vision of people that make a company. And they have made this company extremely important and, and very, very, uh, I'm very proud of it. Uh, it brings me to one last element before I start to say a few words about the topic, the theme. But let, let me just say this. It brings me to the, the murder of George Floyd. When, when George Floyd was murdered, Blaze Simcue called me, and he said, Malefi, what can we do? Let's have a conversation. So we began to have a conversation about the impact of the death of George Floyd on the American society, and to have a conversation um, about how a publishing company that had established itself in the very heart of America's and the world's social sciences, how that company could really uh, put a charge into uh, diversity, uh, into uh, equality, and uh, to inclusion, and, and really make it something. And so we had conversations. And one of the conversations we had was about, well, you're in publishing. If you're in publishing, uh, there are small black publishing companies that need to have some support to really get started in publishing African-American social sciences. And he wanted me to give recommendations. And the recommendation that I gave, there was five or six companies that I considered was a recommendation for IO's company. It was called UWP. So that's how Sage connects with UWP, and then he says, I'm gonna get you the best consultant. Get her the best consultant. And so that's how Gian comes in to the picture, to work with her, you see? So, 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 so from Sage, from Sage, from, from Sarah, 
and that name comes, you remember, Sage comes from Sarah and George. So Sarah, from Sarah's vision of a, a young woman starting a company to Ayo's vision of a young woman starting a company and being willing, she didn't, probably don't want me to say this, but I have to tell you this, but being willing to leave a six-figure job to devote her full-time energy to building UWP is a remarkable story. That's vision. I told her, don't have any fear. Just go for it. Go for full force for it. Go forward. Go forward. Because you, you can't leave that kind of position and say, well, maybe I made a mistake. You didn't make a mistake. <laughs> You go, you're going to you're gonna win. You got to win. This is what Sarah had to do. This is how sage happened. It only happens. And then th this is the theme because it goes back to the theme, you see? I think it's called find a way or something. How do you find? Find a way or make a way. That's the theme for this program. <laughs> find a way or make a way. And so because of that, uh, I, I salute... Uh, uh, her major advisor, uh, Dr. Uh, Daryl Taiwo um, Harris. We said, hold your hand up because people didn't see. You. Uh, and I salute a person who, who actually, through my DNA, I discovered, of course, that my my maternal ancestry goes to Sudan. I, I, I salute my brother Tanuraman from. From, from Nubia. <laughs> and, 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 and I praise my wife, Anna Yaninga, for her being here. Much. And he's absolutely right. When I met him, um, I had UWP since 2004, and, and he said, what are you doing with the publishing company? You know, what are you doing with that? You know, and I was like, well, it's just kind of going. And he said, I'm going to give you a chance. I want you to publish this book for me. And if you do good, we'll keep working together. And he gave me the first book, The Dramatic Genius of Charles Fuller, who recently passed. And this is the only book that has ever been published on this genius scholar because Dr. Sante wanted to do it as a gift for him. It's true, I remember that. And after that, he gave me many of his books that turned UWP around to his social science publishing company. And when he introduced me to Blaze, who is, I have to say, absolutely agree with you, 100% incredible, when he introduced me to Blaze, you know, and they said, okay, you know, there's no money in social sciences. It's just really an, a, an act of, <laughs> you know, activism and, and purpose. And he said, I could teach you how to be a social scientist, but I can't teach you how to do any other publishing. And I said, I'm, I'm there. And it was Dr. Sante's vision that turned the UWP around and led it into a social science publishing company to where I am today. And I've recently published 10 of his 100 books, including Being Human Being. <laughs> and I, I, I just want to say, um, you know, also to his point about Gianni, um, and I've shared this with many of you that I've met already, that for the past two years that Gianni and I have worked together, I think the partnership, when Blaze put us together, it was either he is um, clairvoyant, um, a psychic, uh, <laughs> serendipitous. I mean, I don't know what you want to call it, but we are so alike. We are definitely inseparable. We have, for the past two years, attended more than uh, seven, eight conferences a year. Over the past few years, we spend a lot of time together and we can't get enough. I mean, even in our private time and everything comes back around to publishing. She has made UWP so grounded in the vision of not just Sarah, but in the whole concept of black studies and reclaiming the narrative of black scholars. So the, the motto, we will tell our own story, you know, was grounded in Gianni's vision and in her marketing theme. 
the the motto, you know, black academic uh, excellence was also grounded in Gianni. And I know that anybody else, if, if anybody else had been paired with me to do this work, I don't think this would have gone on as, as strongly as it is and as fast as it's moving. So I want to thank her. And before I give the mic back to Dr. Asante, I want to also thank all of my friends and family who are here today. I mean, like Sage, you know, you guys are amazing. You know, I love you already, you know, but I want to thank Dr. Melissa Harris, who I see here. Thank you so much for coming. You know, future, future, future Dr. Waterman, who just passed our, our, our proposal defense and is now in candidacy. <laughs> I see Reverend Dr. Kanis Chinyaka, who just came back from Kenya and took the time to come here today. Thank you. <laughs> I, I see one of my dearest and close friends, Dr. Joe Grant, who is the Deputy Director of the National Caucus of Black State Legislators. Okay, good. <laughs> um, who else do I see here? Am I missing? Oh, and I see that, uh, Tiffany Lancaster, who just walked in, and she's a D.C. state legislative representative, council, per, council member. State, yes, what she said. And last, but <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> and last but not least, I see Miss Alethea Crawford, who has been one of my confidence, my friends, lifting me up through tough, troubled times. So thank you so much for being here as well. Society was born, as you know, with three challenges. The first one was the genocide of the indigenous people, the uh, enslavement of the Africans, and the denial of the uh, right of equality to women. These were the three basic challenges so that the nation, therefore, was born with severe handicaps. And the attempt on the part of the uh, framers of the uh, Constitution to solve that problem, or at least to address that problem, uh, was uh, actually um, not a serious attempt because, if in fact, the Constitution was written to govern a nation of white men only. That was, of course, uh, its main problem. And the problem, of course, uh, meant that uh, working out uh, various issues uh, had to be determined how best uh, to govern a society where white men would always be in superior positions. This is, uh, this is it, it's in there. It's not like, you know, um, Martin Luther King Jr., the Civil Rights Movement, um, created a new language. The language that was created by African people fighting for liberation uh, had been language that white men had created for themselves. You know, we all created equal. <laughs> white people didn't mean that for black people or even women. The white men who created the frame, frame of the Constitution didn't mean that for us. But the incredible thing about the African experience here in this country is that the documents themselves, the so-called sacred documents, contain in them, a, in a particular way, an avenue for healing that we didn't see, for example, in Brazil. You don't have a document that says that. You don't see it in Mexico. You, you didn't see it, for example, in the so-called Bolivarian republics, Venezuela. You don't see that there, you see? You, you, you don't see it uh, in Ecuador or Peru, and these other American places where you had African populations or, Mac or you know, brought into uh, the, the society. You don't see it. But in America, they made a mistake. <laughs> they, they created these, the Declaration of Independence and, 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 the, 
<laughs> and the Constitution, and they never knew that these African people who were enslaved in this country would ever use these documents because it wasn't for us. You see? So we found a way out of no way. You know what I'm saying? There was no way was just, that was closed off until, of course, you had the ex example and the experience of people like um, Henry Box Brown. We saw we saw Henry Box Brown in the <laughs> in the uh, museum yesterday. Henry Box Brown is an incredible story. I mean, think of this. Here this man is in Virginia, in a, in, a, in, a, in a slave society, and he's enslaved. And he has three children by a woman that becomes, in a sense, his common law wife. And he pays the slave owner money so that the slave owner will not sell his wife to another slave owner. And the slave owner sold his wife and his children to another slave owner. He was devastated. She could no longer, he could no longer see her. He was not on the same plantation anymore. His, his, she sold down the river somewhere, maybe Mississippi, maybe Georgia, who's gone. He learned enough by listening to decide to do something that was dramatic. He built a shipping crate, a box, had a friend who was what we call a free African to help him. He put an address on it in Philadelphia. and shipped himself by boat from Virginia to Philadelphia to the Abolition Society. Can you imagine the ingenuity of that? That's an incredible example. So when I wake up and I say, I can't do this, you know, I say, <laughs> I say oh no, Henry Box Brown figured out a way. You know what I'm saying? Let me give you one more example, and then I'm going to turn it back <laughs> to my colleague, Mary McLeod Bethune. She saw, and she was very young. She was in her 20s. She saw all these black men working on the railroad in Florida. Most people forget, but someone, I don't know what, earlier today, whether it was, maybe it was Todd or Albert, somebody was saying, about how the uh, enslaved Africans built the White House, built the Capitol building. But we also built the railroads in the, in the eastern part of America. We, we spent a lot of, built a lot of the railroads. You know, a lot of the railroads were built. And so in Florida, Mary McLeod saw all these black men working on the railroad. They had families, they had children. And it was really uh, a pathetic situation. And her idea was, how do I save these children? These men are working. The children are just running around. We, we they don't have, how, what do I do? She had no money, but she had a vision. She built a school house. She collected money from people, contributions. Some white people helped her. She built a schoolhouse. And this schoolhouse served for a few years, and she got more money. And eventually, it became a college. And then it was called, and it still exists today, Bethune-Cookman. 
Mary McLeod Bethune became the first real African-American consultant to a president. She was Franklin Roosevelt's confidant. But she built a school. This was an incredible thing. There are many other stories I can tell, but uh, for right now, go ahead, right now. But what I really want to talk about is the revolution of academic publishing and what's going on today in social sciences. Because the theme of making a way or find a way, you know, really resound resolutely right now when in a time where you know, they want to get us back in to 1945, and they're reversing all of the, you know, laws and regulations that has brought us so far, banning abortion, you know, um, you know, closing down schools, banned books, to which my esteemed mentor is a part <laughs> of the esteemed club of banned book scholars, along with Toni Morrison. <laughs> That means they wonder why am I here? <laughs> oh no. No, 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 no. This is a privilege. This is this is definitely a privilege because the people UE is standing with, Tony Morrison, Sonia Sanchez, um, who else? Uh, Robin Kelly, uh, yeah. Alice Walker, Paul Brooks. We're all banned. Can can you imagine? <laughs> Exactly. So in a time where education is more imperative than ever, they are taking away the one thing that we need the most. Dr. Santa just talked about Mary um, Bethune Cookman, the, the, you know, the, co the college that is still standing right now. You know, without that type of making a way to create HBCUs like Howard University that I graduated from, you know, where would we get the knowledge, the impetus, the imperative, the audacity to do all the things that we're doing now, to sit here right now talking about social sciences and, and publishing black scholars and, you know, publishing topics that nobody want to publish? You know, like the languages of how we talk to each other, like how we use the letter B. The American Psychological Association, APA site sensation, just talk about that you got to uppercase the letter B when you're talking about black people. You know, just basic human level activism, like Dr. Sante's 100 book, Being Human Being, telling us that we're all associated and created equal in God's eye, as my friend Dr. Reverend Connie Chinyak over there would tell us. Okay, so we're, we're human being first. And like he said, this country was built on, America, on, on black people's you know, shoulders. This world was built with the imagination, creativity, audacity, you know, downright nerve of black people to be so creative and amazing and powerful, to dream, to imagine, to do amazing things. And that's why I am so grateful to be here today. Because making a way or finding a way or making a way means a lot to me right now. You know, when I met Sarah last year, was it last year, Jihani? <laughs> and she told me about the story of her and Dr. Sante. He was 28 years old. He didn't tell you that. And she was 24 years old. Can you imagine back in the 50s when she was talking about building a social science publishing company, women were still burning bras, talking about they wanted feminism, right, and, and, and freedom. Yet here she was saying, no, I'm going to make a difference in this way. Can you imagine how horrific it must have been for all those white people talking about she's going to publish a black journal, a journal of black studies? Can you imagine how appalled they must, might have been? Yet she did it anyway. She saw a way where there was no way. She knew that it came down to her if there was going to be a difference made. And when I met her, she told me that she reminded me of Dr. Malefiketi Asante, my mentor. She said, I've been waiting for you from the 70s. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Which resonates strongly with when I met you. You know, and so for me, how can I, with the power behind this amazing man, with the power behind 
Sarah Love McCoon, with the power behind Blaze Simcoe, how could I not have the audacity and the nerve and the imagination to not take this mantle up and go forth to make a way where there's no way. I don't know where this is gonna lead. I remember when we first signed the contract and Gianni called me up literally days later and they said, oh my goodness, they're gonna like ban black books. And she said, what are you gonna do? We've done the data, we've done the analysis, we've done the market research and black scholars are only like a small percentage of people who will publish with a black publishing company. What are we gonna do? You know, professors are scared to get published because their tenure is on, at risk, their jobs are at risk, they're not going to want to publish because they're afraid to speak truth because that's a part of the censorship of publishing it's, you know, throughout history. What are we going to do? And I told her a story about another one of my professor, Dr. Alvin Thornton at Howard University. Do you remember that, Joe? We were walking down the hill and, he, and Trump was running in 2016 and, and we were all panicked like, oh my goodness, Trump is going to ruin everything. And he said, listen, we dealt with this. Historically, there was a Nixon and all of these other horrible presidents before. Things have always been horrible, but we made a way <laughs> where there was no way, and things changed. They got better. You had to stay the course. You have to not give up. You've got to really believe in what you're doing and move forward. Yes? Yes. So... <laughs> So when Gianni called me up and said that, what are we going to do? I told her that story. And I said, we're going to keep going. Stay the course. Stay the course. You know, and then now, like, what, six months, a year later, <laughs> now Dr. Asante's on the banned book list. Some of the greatest scholars who we revere and, you know, who are renowned, who have set the foundation for everything that we believe in are on this banned book list. What are we going to do? We're going to stay the course. We're going to keep doing it. Go ahead, Dr. Sutton. Well, thank you very much. What a great uh, a point and a good pivot for me to explain uh, something that someone had asked me earlier. And we have been, Kathy, we have been talking. And it was about Afrocentricity, you know, uh, and uh, Afrocentric schools and Afrocentric education. And of course, uh, Africa is a diverse continent. So the question is, which culture, which society, which group of Africans are included when you say Afrocentric? You see, it's a big question. It's a question that people raise all the time. But what we say is something very, very, uh, I think very clear uh, and, uh, and becomes clearer as you think about it, is that when African people were removed from the continent of Africa, we, removed from, we were removed from the continent of Africa and brought to the Americas, many of the nations out of which we came were sort of forgotten. So that if you ask people uh, to identify uh, where African Americans came from, many people would not know uh, what, what are the ethnic groups out of which the African American population is ma uh, 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 are, are made, uh, is made? And we, I, I don't know. We don't, the names are lost, you see, for a lot of people. So in a sense, there is a composite nature to this notion of African when you start talking about the black population in, in America. And yet all of these uh, all of the all of us who are African come from a particular part of the continent and particular specific histories. You see, so when we say Afrocentric, what we were referring to and what I refer to all the time is the fact that uh, we were not just taken off of our physical terms when we were brought to the Americas, and we were brought all over the Americas. Don't let people tell you that we were only brought to the United States, no. Most of the Africans were brought to Brazil. So we're, we're in Brazil, we're in, in Jamaica, we're in Trinidad, we're in Curaçao, we're in all, all Canada, we're brought to all these places, right? But 
when we were brought to these places, we not only uh, were, uh, as I said, brought physically away from our terms, we were taken off of our own philosophical, religious, linguistic, uh, uh, cultural terms. So our terms were different. So our terms became, in many ways, the, the terms of those who were our masters in their minds, right? So, so if the master said, I'm sick, we would say, we sick, <laughs> you know? You know say, I, us sick, too. I mean, if the master's sick, because we have the same terms. We, we were, in effect, black people whose vision of the world and the visions of our capabilities were limited by what we saw in the white world. That was, that was it. This is why Afrocentricity was revolutionary. And this is why it was scared, scary. Because it said to the African, you don't have to be on the white plantation. Neither physically nor intellectually. You got your own way to think. You come from a history of cultures and societies that had philosophers long before there were philosophers in Greece. Ptahotep and Imhotep and Dwarf and Amenemope and Akhenaten and Amenhotep, the son of Hapu. These were philosophers who lived thousands of years, some of them, before Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. So, so, so why are we only on European terms? They're not the, be Europe is not the beginning of civilization. The Homo sapiens rise in one continent. Homo sapiens rise in Africa only. All human beings, therefore, have their origin in East Africa, as far as science knows. There's no polygenesis. We didn't rise in South America and the Caribbean and the Pacific Ocean and Europe simultaneously with rising in Africa. We only rose in Africa. That's where Homo sapiens come from. And then we spread to the rest of the world from Africa and the civilizations of Africa, the earliest civilizations, the Nile Valley complex. You have to go back to Nubia. It's the, it's the basic civilization of all humanity. And from Nubia to Kemet, which the Greeks renamed what? Egypt. The Africans didn't call it Egypt. They called it Kemet, the black land. They called Kush, this is Nubia, Kush, the land of the black people, you see. This is very, this, that Nile River runs through only one continent, Africa. It doesn't run through Europe, Asia, or South America, or North America. Just only one continent, Africa. So when you're talking about Nile Valley civilization, you're talking about African civilization. Now, I mean, we know as a political scientist, and Dr. Harris certainly teaches this, and he knows that, that as a political scientist, we know that right now it's occupied by Arabs, but Arabs are from Arabia. They're not indigenous. Arabic was not indigenous to Africa. The ancient Egyptians did not speak Arabic. The ancient people of Sudan did not speak Arabic. They spoke Nubian. They spoke Medunetja, we call Chikam, the language of Kemet. That's totally different. But of course, DeSantis doesn't want you to know that. Go ahead and talk. You know, and and um, you know, and that's a great, like, really excellent point. You know, which is why it's really important for all of us to really go back and study our history and our culture. You know, if you have the opportunity, the naming, like Dr. Asante said, you know, Africa had seven dynasties before the seventh dynasty fell with the enslavement of black people. Can you imagine that? Seven powerful, successful, flourishing, rich dynasties before the fall of black people. 
you know, with the, with the enslavement of black people. So, you know, go back, do your DNA research, get your name. My name, doc, you know, Ayo Sakai came from Dr. Asante. You know, being named is one of the most important things that you can do because it stands in your power, your Afrocentric power, to know who you are and to know where you stand. Dr. Uh, Dr. Taiwo Aris, I remember in one of our very first class, we laughed about this all the time, in one of our very first classes, and he, he got up in the class and he stood up and he said, stand, you know, you're standing right here. Whether you move to the left or the right, you're still making a decision. If you stand in the same position, you've still made a decision. So if you do not do anything, you're choosing to do nothing. If you move to the left or the right, you're choosing to make that decision. So choosing to understand your culture, choosing to understand history, choosing to understand how we're all you know, implicit and complicit to, to what's happening, it's not a blame game. It's not about saying, oh, you know, you bad white people or, you know, anything like that. It is not about that. It is about acknowledging that we're all benefiting, if you're white, from the legacy of enslavement. There is a benefit to being white. You know, a black person cannot walk into the streets and say, oh, you know, I'm going to be Jewish today. Or I'm going to be Turkish today. Or, you know, today I'm not a black person. You know, you walk with the skin, with the, with the history of who you are and your ancestry on your skin. You know, so knowing the history of not just black people, but you, you know, but your history as well is very important, which is why it's one of the things that I mentioned earlier, you know, during lunch, you know, Gianni and I were looking, we're looking to publish a book on the history of white people. We're looking to publish a book on the history of white women because these are the stories that no one are, no one's telling. These are the story that people need to know you know, this is about reclaiming the narrative so that we are no longer the observed, but to reclaim and be the observers of history like we are. We are the original griots, the original storytellers. You know, but if everyone is looking at black people and telling our stories and rewriting the narrative and, you know, erasing whatever they want to do and editing us out of history, and you're not telling that story from a black Afrocentric perspective, so that we know who we are, so that we can tell our truth, then the lion will always be the winner when he's hunting the lion, right? The, the hunter will always be the winner when he's hunting the lion. Is that African proverb? You know, you know the, the hunter is always gonna tell the story until the lion can tell the story because I'm sure that hunter got quite a few scratches before he took the <laughs> black people down. <laughs> Well, we not we could talk. Yeah, we could talk all day. Like <laughs> between, between with Ayo and I, we, you, I mean, don't tell us that now. I mean, because we can go on. I mean, that's right. Like, you do have about ten more minutes. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Doctor Doctor Harris. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah. Th yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. The the uh, you know that uh, you were reading my notes. That was one of my, <laughs> that was one of my people. I mean Harriet Tubman. I had on here Harriet Tubman, Robert Smalls, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, Carver, and uh, Kizzy Corbett. But let, let me just talk a little bit about, those were the people I, I wanted to use as examples, but we don't have time for all that. But let me just, let me just talk really about Harriet, because uh, uh, I'm on a, we on a, you know, Philadelphia is, is, uh, is, com is commissioning an artist to do a huge statue of uh, Harriet Tubman for downtown Philadelphia. And I'm on the committee, I'm on the art committee commission for that in Philadelphia. I, I live in Philadelphia. So uh, this is a, is a big thing. And Harriet Tubman, for me, I've always said 
that she is the greatest person that I know who has ever lived in the United States. I don't know anybody greater that I could point to. Uh, there have been some great people in this country um, from all different cultures, but I don't know personally anyone that I would consider greater than Harriet Tubman. And, and just briefly, I'll tell you why. Because uh, she was 24 years old uh, when she decided uh, to leave her husband and to escape to freedom. And not only to escape to freedom, but also to take as many people with her as she could. And that is uh, uh, from Maryland uh, to Pennsylvania. That, that is from Eastern Shore of Mar Maryland to uh, Philadelphia. And she did that 19 times, taking groups with her as she went. I mean, because she eventually um, mastered the route where she would not be discovered. And uh, the reason she was great is because, number one, of her courage, and number two, because of her intelligence. She was able to read the stars. Um, sometimes when I tell the story, I have to pause because it is, I, I, um, it is the greatest story in America. Uh, see, um, slavery was an economic situation, which meant that what she did by taking away Africans from the slave system was undermining the economic position of the white slave owners. It was not just taking people, it was taking commodities, people that were used for uh, making things, producing things, harvesting. She, she took that away, 300 people. She, she robbed them of that. And then during the Civil War, she, she saved another 700 from a plantation in South Carolina. Over 1,000 people. And somebody went to her and said, Harriet, they say you, you save these people. And she said, well, they say I've saved a thousand, but I could have saved a thousand more if they only knew they were slaves. But, but their consciousness was not there, you see. Because some people, they love the master more than they love freedom. But, but her, 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 her courage, um, uh, intelligence, and the fact that she affirmed human dignity, that's the key. And that's what Dr. I think Dr. Harris's question gets to that to me, because it's the affirmation of human dignity that's at the core of freedom. I mean, if you can't affirm another human being when you see them, this is why in the South, we, we, I mean, I'm not, I'm not accusing those of you who were born in the North, but those of us in the South, when we see a human being, we say hi. <laughs> when I first moved to the North and I would speak to people, they would look at me crazy like, what's he talking about? You know, I'm just, they don't know that. But we knew that in Georgia. You know, you affirm, it's an affirmation of a human. So I appreciate that, that, can, that question. You, you want to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I would definitely like to add something about the intelligence part of, of Harriet Tubman. I mean, not only was she everything that Dr. Asante said, okay, but this woman knew that she should not hide black people where black people live. <laughs> <laughs> Right? She found allies, just like the, the people of color and the allies collective right here at SAGE. <laughs> she found allies, and she took those black people, and she hid them in their houses. Because when the white enslavers come, they're not going to be looking in the white people's houses. <laughs> they're going to be looking in the black people's houses. So a testament to just her sheer brilliance. She found allies, 
people who believed in human dignity, like you said, Dr. Asante, people who understood that we are all human beings. And she took them and she hid them. And she not only did that, she helped give them homes, the allies, helped teach them to read, helped them get a, a life, turn, um, live in society, become contributing members of society. She was brilliant. So a testament, not just to Ari Tubman, but to all of the black geniuses that we see every day. Yeah. Carter, G. Wooden, 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 Carter G. Woodson said that black children were born brilliant. You know, but all children are born brilliant, and it depends on how we nurture each other. You know, we are the ones who are teaching these little black children and white children to fear each other. We are the ones, especially the parents who are telling their, their oh, they don't want um, black history books in the classroom, and they don't want their children to know about, you know, the sitting and marching and, and children getting watered down and attacked by dogs. You know, I mean, we are the ones that's teaching our children to fear each other. But we can prevent that because we were born human beings. We were born allies. And we can change the narrative, you know, using, taking away from linguistic imperialism, using, you know, you know, changing the terms and the language that we use, and owning our complicitness in everything that happened, we can make a difference. So yeah, to our sheer brilliance, absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Melfi, you had made a statement saying that the people who were enslaved at the time, they loved their master more than they loved the idea of freedom. What were some elements that contributed to that? Because the only one I'm aware of could be the Willie Lynch letter, but that was so, that wasn't even that long ago when it came to looking at the time period of slavery within North America. So from your perspective and also Dr. Ayo, what are some other elements that contributed to that of loving the slave owner more than the idea of freedom? Thank you very much. I, I think, by the way, the Willie Lynch letter is probably um, a, a, a letter created in, in this era. Uh, and so I wouldn't necessarily use that as any reference point, all right? Uh, but it was, it was very brilliantly done. And it was done on the basis of the historical facts. And one of the facts is, is this, I think that uh, if you enslave a person and you keep that person from all knowledge of themselves, of their history, if you keep them from, um, you know, like the laws were, and I think that maybe Dr. Sakai may have mentioned it or earlier, I mean, we couldn't, it was illegal to teach black people to read or to write. So you can't read or write. And in fact, in the 1830s, after the Nat Turner Revolution, uh, a rebellion, one of the things that uh, was written by the Virginia uh, um, um, legislature was that we, we should keep them from the light of day. That the more, the more knowledge you give to black people, the more dangerous they become. So you, can, you have to shut out, and this is what they, they wrote, this is in the text. We have to shut out all light of day if they hear about the Haitian Revolution, where black people rose up against the French and slaughtered the French, and Desaline took Haiti away from the French. They can't hear. We cannot. I mean, Nat Turner's re rebellion was enough because that group of Africans killed 61 white people in a two night. Say no, we cannot. Do, we can never allow that to happen again. They should know nothing. They should any white person who teaches a black person to read should be punished. So it was everything was shut down. So part of that is that then when you shut down that, uh, you you realize that um, uh, a, an enslaved person. Uh, that a, that a slave is not born, that, that slaves are made. And, and you make a, a person a, a slave, or you enslave a person, you take away their names. So, so when an African no longer knows his or her name, they don't have a history or genealogy. But if I know my name, 
then I always will know genealogy and ancestry. I know where I come from. I know what my name means, you see. I have some connection. But no African got off the boat from Africa and said, my name is Booker T. Washington. You know what I'm saying? Or Martin Luther King. Or a Rosa Parks. We didn't get off the boat like that. So who are these people? Before they were these names, what ethnic communities or nations or kingdoms did they come from? What, what, what were they? That is, because if you know the name, you know something. We, we um, interestingly, today, uh, we went into um, to breakfast, and the lady who served us told my wife her name was Fatou. So my wife said, are you from Senegal? How does she know that? She knows from the name. She didn't, the lady didn't say, I'm from Senegal. I'm serving you oatmeal. <laughs> the lady just say, the lady just say, she was Fatou. So when, 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 I, when, Dr., when I met Dr. Harrison, he said, you know, my name is Taiwo. I knew that he had a relationship to Yoruba culture. I know by the name. This is, that's the important thing, you see? The name is meaningful. But if you take away the name, and I think that I am Robert E. Lee, and I want to be like Robert E. Lee, I want to eat like Robert E. Lee, I want to talk like Robert E. Lee, before long, I hate myself for what I am. And I become like the slave master, the slave owner, you see. And I'll protect the slave owner before I even uh, uh, protect another African. I will even kill the other African for the slave owner. Because again, we in the book, uh, Being Human Being, we talk about the racial ladder. Somebody asked me the other day, wh wh what about those black police who killed uh, uh, the black guy in Memphis? I said, yeah, they were following the race paradigm. And the race paradigm is that a black person is not worth much. And black people believe that. That's, that, that. The black people who, those black police, they believe the same thing the white police believe. So then you, you, you attack on the basis of that, you see. But the affirmation of, this is why Black Lives Matter is such an important, powerful point. The affirmation of a black life Wow, that, that's a revolutionary. Because in a racial uh, hierarchy, that doesn't matter. In a racial hierarchy, the idea is black people at the bottom. And anybody can attack them, even other black people. So Aria Tubman said, I could have freed more slaves if only they had known they were slaves. Right, I could have freed more. And to your question about why we are still like that, the slave mentality. The story that I tell is like a little kindergarten type story, you know, of an elephant. Think about the elephants that have been in captive for all these years and working at circuses and stuff like that, right? These are one of the most powerful animals that you could ever see and meet. And for centuries or, or hundreds of years, okay, these elephants have been chained right? You beat the elephant. You know, if the elephant tried to move or run away, they're powerful. But guess what? You're going to cut off the elephant legs. If the elephant tried to assert its agency, you're going to buck break the elephant. If the elephant have a baby, you're going to sell the elephant's baby and give it away. So it's a learned behavior to be compliant. It's a learned behavior to be compliant. So as you become a, a child, a mother, a sibling, an aunt, an uncle, whatever it is, the fear is that if you teach yourself independent thought, if you try to make any change, the same thing that happened to them is going to happen to you. So it's very, very easy to bow breed, beat people into compliance by making sure they're afraid. Thank you so much. Tanudaman told me a story once that uh, in uh, this is because it works in every society where you have hierarchy that in Sudan 
uh, one of the ways that they break the will of the black people uh, is to, uh, when you go to school, is to tell you you can't use your own language. And if you use your own language, you get whipped. So you can't use your own language. <laughs> you, can't, you can't use your mother's language. You may not even be able to use your own indigenous name. But this, but this happened with the Native Americans here too. There was a whole movement with the Native Americans to try to make them uh, uh, white people uh, and try to, what do they call it, to, to get rid of the savage and save the man or something like that. Some, some crazy situation like that, you see. This, is, this happens over and over again. So it, it is true. I'm sorry, go right at them. Thank you all so much for this conversation, and I think that this should continue, not just during Black History Month, but it should continue. Um, it was stated that Harriet Tubman, you know, her, her mm -hmm. wisdom with the stars yes. and her wisdom with bringing in the whites to be a part of this journey. Uh, but I would like for you all to also touch on her contribution in helping slaves return to Africa. Um, so before you answer that question, Dr. Asante, this is uh, Ms. Celeb Samende Lloyd. She is the founder of a Woman's Wing, a nonprofit here in DC. She actually have a star in DC because she's, um, you know, I, I guess, um, awarded as a as a um, ambassador and advocate. So she has a Walk of Fame star, and this is a, a tremendous ambassador. She's actually Liberian royalty and from Liberia. Well. I, I'm just been appointed to advisory committee at the University of Liberia in Monrovia uh, as a uh, person on the committee for um, uh, actually uh, reintegration uh, of, of Africans. And in fact, there's a big committee uh, about uh, that that has just been set up by uh, President Nelson and some other people at, at the University of Monrovia. I was just there last year. Uh, but let me just say this, uh, because this relates to Harriet, but not so much for her helping uh, people go back to Africa. That part of the story I'm not familiar with. But I'm familiar with this, that in the year that she was born, which was 1822, was the same year that that ship called the Elizabeth left America going to Liberia. And in 1822, when the Elizabeth, this, is, this was also part of my, st my talk about making a way. The Africans who left on that ship in 1822 going to Liberia, this is a historic voyage. And one day there should be a movie about this, this whole experience. The, 1822 was the year that Harriet Tubman was born. 1822 was also the year that black people fed up with America had decided that they were going to leave America and go to Africa. And of course, uh, the, there was a big group against, there was a group for, and black people, uh, almost 100 of them, uh, got together and uh, they went to, uh, went to Liberia. This is to the beginning of that whole uh, uh, trip of Africans going to Liberia. Now, Africans had already gone back to Sierra Leone. 
they had already been Africans, going to Sierra Leone because they went to Sierra Leone from Nova Scotia and, they, and from Jamaica. They'd been there. But the Africans who went back to uh, Monrovia, as the sister was saying, uh, uh, that um, uh, they found in Africa there were already groups of people who occupied the territory. So you can't just go back to Africa. There are people who are already who are there. And, and some of the ones who went back may have left from there. But many of the ones who went back did not necessarily come from those particular regions of Africa, you see? So many of the so-called americo Liberians who went back in 1822 may very well have come from Angola or Congo, but now they're going to Africa, anywhere in Africa. But when they get there, they find people there who got their own societies, their own uh, laws, their own customs, and so on. But because they were Americans, and this is what she was saying, they imposed, when they got in, they imposed on the population certain sort of superior attitudes that they had inherited from the whites in the American situation on the local populations. So that created friction that till this day exists in Liberia, but of course the governments have tried over and over again to ameliorate this and to create a situation where all Liberians are accepted as Liberians and with equality and freedom. But the American Liberians uh, for a long time had the notion of being uh, sort of the elite class of Liberia. But I think that's changing. I really do think it's changing. So that's my, yes please. But also, um, when they went back to Liberia, there were whites that went along with them. Mm -hmm. The Kukas clan helped with that ship going too. They paid, they helped to pay for that ship because they were anxious for blacks to get out of here. So they had a role in that as well. Uh, I think a no, small no, that's not, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's not true. There was not the Ku Klux Klan. The American Colonization Society helped, but there was no Ku Klux Klan in 1822. They didn't come. At the time, but they didn't have the organization. They were not called the Ku Klux Klan. No, the Ku Klux Klan did not, oper did not operate until 1877. Yes, they were not called the Ku Klux Klan, but they were that Klan group that still operates, and now they are called the Ku Klux Klan. But they play a very small role in that. But what I wanted to say, you said when they got to Liberia, but there were whites that went with them also and started the rubber plantation that we have now, Firestone. And the whites started Firestone in Liberia, which was called the rubber plantation, and had the blacks that were supposed to be free working on that plantation, starting off, I think, with one cent or a you know, few dollars. So a this is a This is a very complicated history, and I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to have a, I mean, I, I've, written, I, I've written a book called The History of Africa, and I'm pretty well familiar with the history of Liberia, but that, that is not, uh, I mean, I understand it's complicated, but uh, so I don't want to have a, a debate about it, but, uh, but no, the, 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 uh, the, the creation of Firestone and Goodyear uh, came years after blacks had already entered in 1822 because you didn't have rubber as a big factor in the world until the creation of the automobile, and that was later. So, so but, and then the, it is true that the American Colonization Society, which was largely a religious group, uh, did get engaged in uh, uh, supporting the immigration movement. And I think that uh, it is correct to say that some of the, uh, the Africans who oppose the, um, uh, the return to Africa, the ones who oppose, uh, their argument was that no, we want to stay here and fight with our brothers and sisters who are enslaved to uh, make sure that we keep agitating because if all of the blacks who were freed and all of them who escaped, if they all went to Liberia, who would protect and honor the black people who were in, um, 
uh, uh, who were in the in the in, in slavery and in the in bondage and so forth and so on. So, but it's a complicated history. But uh, I think that's all I want to say on that. I think, I think it was closer to when Marcus Garvey, right? Marcus Garvey is the one who met with the KKK, yes. you know, because, because the, the Ku yes. Klux Klan wanted us out of here, yes. and Marcus Garvey was like, well, you want us gone, we want to be gone too. Yes. <laughs> you know, so that's the history, yeah, so that's the history, you know, of where the KKK and, and Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. of course, who's one of Jamaica's seven national heroes, and, you know, that's a different type of history yeah. <laughs> that I won't go into. Um, so, yeah. In honor of Black History Month, um, Dr. Ben and as a fellow HBCU grad, can we talk about uh, what HBCUs mean to the black community and why that was even started in the first place? That's for you, Beth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I, I, grad, I graduated from Howard University. Um, you know, like I, um, I think it was it's Lincoln College. Is that the oldest HBCU? Lincoln, Lincoln University, Lincoln University. That's your alma mater, isn't it, Dr. Joseph? Well, Chain and Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you know, um, you know, so, you know, HBCUs were founded just like sorority and fraternities were founded. You know, again, white people did not want black people in their colleges and universities. So we made a way or found a way, right? <laughs> we found a way or made a way. So we made our own universities. They didn't want us in our soror their sororities and fraternities. So, you know, we either made a way or we, or we found a way. Um, you know, the impact of what HBCUs and, and, and so black sororities and fraternities have meant to, to black scholars historically is tremendous. Um, you know, a lot of us go to HBCUs because we want to honestly get a true history of who we are, you know, of, of education from a black perspective without it being marred, marred by Eurocentric ideology. A lot of history is being taught from a Eurocentric perspective, you know, where everything began in, you know, by the Greeks and the Roman, uh, you know, um, Plato, Aristotle, you know, all of these are the philosophers and the kind of history that we're taught. Usually if you go to a PWI, which is a predominantly white university. But when you go to HBCUs, you get to learn about philosophers like that, Maleficent Asante, which is how I met him. So I think the impact has been, is, has been great. Um, just by perpetu perpetuation of you being here, by, by me being here, by Mr. Dr. Char uh, Dr. Chaz Gibson, my brother over here, being here, who is also a Morehouse graduate, you know, Dr. Joseph back there, Lincoln graduate, you know, and of course my other colleagues who are from Howard University. So I think it's, it's very impactful and it makes a huge difference. Okay, let me do a, uh, let me do a real Malefi Asante. Uh, throw the wrench into the whole thing. <laughs> and that's what, that's why I'm banned, right? <laughs> I, I've traveled, I, I've said this, and I just said this in Cameroon. I was just telling the, the guy who is a security guard down here, uh, Thomas, he's from Cameroon, and I've just been to Cameroon. And I told them that I've been all over Africa. I've never seen an African university. I have never truly seen a true Afrocentric HBCU, not one. Now you can name, the closest I, we came to was Tougaloo at one time, but I've never seen it. Doesn't mean that there's not good things happening. My son teaches at HBCU. So there's good things happening at HBCUs, but I guarantee you that the majority of them are Eurocentric. So let's be honest, we got problems with the HBCUs. So it's very nice of you to mention that they, they will learn about me, but very few of them learn about me. And he's a professor, Adam, he knows. No, Asante is banned at the HBCUs just like I'm banned. Now Henry Louis Gates is not banned at the HBCUs. He's celebrated. But when Asante is, because I believe that white supremacy needs to be dismantled. That's why I'm bad. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that it, this is, these are internal African-American battles. 
<laughs> but they are serious battles. They, they really are because, um, you know, even as you speak and, and we speak today, I mean, Howard University is being diversified with more white Arab, you know, um, people from um, Sudan than ever before because affirmative action have always benefited white people more than they've benefited black people. I know you're going to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I got to throw another wrench. My, my other wrench is because you just published our, our book, uh, Being hum, Human Being. It doesn't matter to me what people's ethnicities are. I don't care whether they are Arabs or whether they are English or whether they are French or Indian, if they're teaching in a HBCU, they ought to honor African culture. That's, that's what I'm talking about. I don't care whether what they're, you can have them. I know. That's the but that's problem. What I'm well, that's a problem of black leadership that's true. at the HBCU. That's true. That's I mean, who, who hires these people without <laughs> vetting them? Somebody had to hire these people without <laughs> vetting them. But it, you know but it does saying? come back to money, right? It comes back to money, doesn't it? It's like, it, you know, that's I all the trail. Because, the, money, because <laughs> <laughs> we have two <laughs> 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 Because <laughs> All right, so ditto, 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 bear witness at Howard University. So my question kind of links to okay. that as a graduate of Howard Thank in you. communication, culture, and media studies classes. Learning about Fire Marshall and McLuhan and, yes, and yeah. all these got people That's who right. don't look like me. So That's I right. totally get it. So having to find that on my own. So my question leads to being a younger scholar, how do we, in our writing and our publishing, how do we, because, you know, we try to publish in mainstream journals. Um, they'll we tell us. We say mainstream. <laughs> so. <laughs> White journals. White journals. Okay, okay. white journals. <laughs> Honestly. So when we try to publish there, when we do um, cite scholars, when we Africanize the canon, as you instructed right. us to do, as I read right. in my studies, <laughs> and I did, but when I send it off to an editor, they, they send it back to me. Right. And they're like, well, what about yeah. Goldsman? And what about Blake? And this and that. So how do we approach publishing? Um, yeah. Africanizing it, being true to ourselves, and still needing to make a living. You, you have raised a re that's a million dollar question. The, that's the big problem we have. And that uh, we have that problem for a historical reason. Because when HBCUs were set up, the, uh, uh, when we had European benefactors, and most of them have many white trustees on their boards, they did not allow black colleges to have university presses. So you couldn't have a university press. So Morehouse doesn't have a university press, as far as I know. Clark Atlanta doesn't have one, all right? So what does that mean? That means that you got to get your books from white presses. And that means not only that you have to get your books from white presses, all your journals are published by white people. So now, if you are going to get tenure, you can't write Afrocentric But I, I could, let me just show you one thing. This is a book that was published by, doc, by Dr. Ayo's Press. It's called Revolutionary Pedagogy. It would never have been published, I don't believe, by a white company. Now maybe Sage may have published <laughs> it, but I, I don't know. But the Sage reviewers wouldn't accept it. The company may have accepted it, but, but the Sage reviewers say, oh, he's talking about revolutionary pedagogy. What is he going to he's, he's against the Eurocentric education of black kids? Yes. <laughs> There's a real problem here, you see? So I think that what we have to do, we have to, and this is for those of you in HBCUs, you've got to create more journals. You've got to become editors. You create your own journal. We, we, we get so many articles in JBS, we, 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 couldn't, we just can't publish all the articles. But you've got to create journals. You have to, you be an active scholar. You, go, you become a Sarah Miller. You, you, Sarah Miller said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna directly influence source of science. I'm going to create Sage publication, and I'm going to control the journals if I need to. 
you, 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 you say, I'm going to build African-American journals that will then be at least open to reviewing African-American authors. That's what we have to do. And in the meantime, you publish with Universal Right Publications. <laughs> <laughs> Supported by, supported by Sage Publishing, that gives you the international distribution, that make UWP the only black woman-owned, doctor-owned, social science publishing company in the world today. Okay? <laughs> you know, and, 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 and just, and, and like Dr. Santa said, until you can find the journals and publish our own journals, then you gotta become the editors. We gotta pull behind the curtains, you know, behind the institution. Become the reviewers. Sign up to review journals and books. Sign up to be the editors. Sign up to do book reviews. Sign up to do anything that you can behind the curtains in the meantime. You gotta start somewhere. Right? right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, Come so on to the this mic. is the doctor, both the doctors, Malifi and Ayo. If you had to give advice to yourself, Dr. Malifi, today, knowing what you know today, in 1969, when you went to Sarah McLuhan, what would, advice would you give to yourself to get to where you are today? Well, the advice that uh, I would give to myself is be persistent, be clear, be disciplined, and always express your work with uh, a degree of integrity based on character, good character. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. So what advice would you give yourself as being a scholar as you are today? back when you first started your journey? Um, I think I stumbled into the right path. <laughs> and I think for where I am sitting right now, with all of you here at Sage, the People Collective, you know, um, and, and allies, you know, with all of you here, with Sage, with you, Gianni, you know, with Blaze, with you, Dr. Asante, I would have, I don't think I would change anything that happened in my path, even though I stumbled into Dr. Sante, because that journey brought me here. And I don't think that there's anything that could change. All I can do, because I'm, I'm in his footsteps and I'm in his shadow and I continue to learn and grow, is that I keep learning and growing and that we're all open to keeping the conversation going. Albert Shimana. Here, right? yes. uh -huh. um, I think I can speak on behalf of everybody to say I am so in awe of you too. Uh, I've seen you a couple of times now and about half an hour ago you said, what's next? And you said, we could go on for hours here. Yeah. And I'm like, and I'm like, and I think everybody is, please do, please do. Every time uh, I see you speak and I learn something new. And I want to thank you for that. And I hope we have many more conversations. I'm, I'm a VP of Customer Service and Fulfillment at Sage. And I'm also the, um, um, uh, God, I'm executive. losing my words. <laughs> the executive sponsor of the, uh, uh, the POC uh, uh, ERG, the uh, Employee Resource Group. And I'm obviously an ally of that. And I was thinking this, you know, you said so many things. And, and one of the things was giving a name. And I know before Io and I met, you know, I looked up Io and I saw it's a Yoruba name. And then I looked at the meaning of it and I thought, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, and, and so it is important uh, giving a name and understanding your history, uh, what it means. Uh, but as an ally, I, I, I think courage, getting yourself educated uh, and being intelligent about things, what we spoke about, is so important. Uh, I was born in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, and the Netherlands is a very liberal environment, especially Amsterdam. 
So I grew up and I said, I am very liberal. My father was very liberal. He could have, he could have lived in the States because he said, uh, you know, everybody has to have their say. And don't dispute it. You can, you can talk about it, but everybody has to have their say. I thought, I'm so liberal. And then with my wife, with my wife, we moved to Brooklyn, New York. Um, and in it, it, that's, that's little or, or big, um, um, uh, <coughs> uh, sorry again, <laughs> uh, big um, uh, Caribbean. Uh, so I, I uh, was thrown into a, what is it, 95, 90, 80% black uh, American environment, and I found myself scared. <laughs> I was like, wow, and it took me a while to get used to that. And, you know, I was so liberal, and I was thrown in, and, 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 and Amsterdam is a multi, multicultural society, right? You, you go, you have people from Indonesia to Suriname, ABC Islands, and all of a sudden I found myself, wow, I don't know what to do here. Now, it took me a couple of weeks, and then, these people were fantastic. Uh, it was fantastic environment, fantastic food. But I learned something. Um, and, and I want, as an ally, I want to say that to the white people, educate yourself. Realize that you don't know what you, what you haven't seen, you don't know. You have to learn about it. And even going to the internet and listening to you, it's education, but talk with the black people, the POC people. Learn about them. That's how you get to understand. And as long as we do, don't do that, you know, it's hard. You have to have the courage to do that. It takes uncomfortable conversations and courage. Uh, so that's uh, one I to, wanted to give with you. I have to thank some people. Uh, but thank you first, first and foremost. Thank you first and foremost for educating us and, and being with us. Let me, I have to write that down because I'm going to forget something. Um, I first, uh, some, some, a lot of sage people I want to thank. Uh, first of all, Tony Legons from the DEI office. And then uh, we have Monica Simon who is here today and Anna Rubio is not. from the U.S. Cultural Collective. Then from the POC and Allies group, Angelia and Thelma, you've, you've seen them. And uh, Craig and Justice, Thelma's daughter. Then we have our, our brand new Chief People's Officer, Joy Lindsday, who has helped us too. And I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, Tracy Ryan from this office, uh, you set up the museum tour. And then Tula, uh, also from this office, the, uh, uh, who has done the gift bags and all kinds of other things. Luke Marquez, uh, who, uh, manager of events. And then Lucy Sullivan and Rachel Consos uh, for the video production. That's it, thank you. Thanks, Albert. Um, my name's Todd Baldwin, and I'm executive lead for the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, and I got to say, the last two days have been such an emotional roller coaster and so intellectually stimulating. Thank you for the latter today. That was, uh, I'm, right now, I'm, I'm filled with a lot of different emotions, but most among them is gratitude and, and hope. Gratitude for, to, to, Dr. Asante and, and Dr. Sakai for joining us here and sharing that with us. That was amazing. Um, and gratitude to all of the people that put this together. Um, I just, again, want to thank, I, I, Albert thanked everybody, but, <laughs> but, but make a point of doing it yourself. It was great uh, to, to watch them work together to make this all happen, and it's a beautiful event. Thank you. Um, also, gratitude to all of you for coming to the Washington, D.C. office and enjoying this with us. It, 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 it makes my heart full to see so many people here and being enriched by this. Yes. The, 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 the hope part um, comes from, um, well, let me start with the fact that 
When George Floyd was murdered uh, in 2020, it was a dark time for all of us, right? I don't know if any of you remember, but just a couple of blocks from here, there were protesters that were being gassed, right? It was, it, and, and that was the genesis of Black Lives Matter Plaza right now. Go down there and visit it. It's there. It's painted in bright yellow colors. If you haven't seen it already, it's an amazing testament to, to, to that moment. But right now, what I feel is hope. I heard what you said about it's always bad, <laughs> but actually I feel hope and optimism right now. And a lot of that comes from all of the, the, the faces that I'm seeing here, the voices that I'm hearing for the first time in SAGE. It is amazing to hear how much energy and passion and intelligence that we're bringing to making uh, the, the, these events happen, to making SAGE a better place. And so when I say I'm hopeful, I think we are at the most hopeful moment yes. in our history at SAGE.